Okay, so yes, as Bethan said, um, I'll show you the modeling side of things now, uh, and I'll go through how to upload a model on Daphne and then how to go about running it in a workflow and some of the bits around that. Um, so we'll start by logging in. Um, so yeah, Bethan's taking you through data um, and the bits that I'll be going through are models and workflows. Models being the things that people upload to Daphne to, to run, and then workflows being the method of actually running those as well. So if I go into the model catalog here, it's fairly similar to the data catalog apart from uh, we're looking at models this time. Um, so I'll probably just start by saying how to actually get a model onto Daphne. These are all models that have been uploaded by our users or by us. A lot of the earlier models were done as part of pilot projects. So we worked with people to understand more about what they actually needed from our side to be able to provide this sort of generic system for people to upload models. And I think what we've got is actually really powerful and, and really easy to use. And it's it's nice to see users actually uploading models that we've had no intervention with. They're just sort of able to do it by themselves, which is is really good. So I'll go into a little bit about the sort of technical side of how to upload a model, um, but I won't talk too much about that. So there are sort of two main things that you need to upload a model onto Daphne. The first is um, a metadata file. So this is a, a YAML file and it's got sort of your typical stuff that you would expect to see. So a display name, a description, um, these are all input parameters. We can take input parameters in the form of environment variables that get passed through to the model. Um, and you'll see how a user can configure these at runtime. Um, but we also take inputs in the form of data sets, which is something Beth mentioned. So you can choose a certain piece of data, let's say the 2011 census, and that'll be loaded in by default into your, into your model. Um, but then if, if the, next census comes out, you could then swap those out at runtime again. So you could just use the same model on a, a totally different data set, which is, is really nice. Um, obviously the data set has to be compatible with the model code. And then at the end, you've just got a list of the output data sets that, that come out of that um, model. And then over here, we've got a Docker file. So for those of you not familiar with Docker, and Brian mentioned a little bit about this earlier, uh, it's a way of essentially packing up your code into a, a container and then you can ship it off somewhere else and unpack it on the other side and everything's the same as it was when you sent it kind of a thing. So it gets away from all of the problems that people have about, oh, you're running Windows, you're running Linux, how are we gonna get this model to work on, on two different environments? And it basically makes sure that the user's code will run the same for us as it does for them. Um, and this doc file, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but you essentially start from an operating system. So that already gives you sort of a blank slate and a common slate from to start with it, which is the operating system. You then grab a load of packages that you need to run your model. Here they Git clone the, the model from GitHub into the container. And then from there, you can just carry on and, and, and actually run the thing. And so once you've got that, you can come back to Daphne and you can click add model. And then there's these a variety of different steps that we ask people to go through um, uh, in, before their model comes onto Daphne. So these are the, the sort of steps. And for each of these steps, we've got extensive documentation available on how to actually do that, which is all really nice and uh, really useful for, pe for people to actually do that. We've also got a catalog of um, example models that we've uploaded, which are you know fairly small things that you can use as a template to get you started kind of thing. Um, so there's all of that stuff available here. And once you've done that, um, you can then browse the files on your computer. Here I've like, um, I've built the image on my own PC, but then I've also uh, zipped it up into this tarball, which makes it a, a lot quicker to upload. And so you grab those two files and press upload, and then it would go ahead and do that, but we're not gonna wait for that to do, to finish. So. The model that I was uploading, I should probably said, is the um, COVID-19 COVID sim model, which came out of um, uh, Imperial College London. So that they have a GitHub page available where you can grab the code uh, and their doc file was already written. So it was quite an easy one and also quite a topical model to, to use for demonstration purposes. Um, so that model has been uploaded now. You can see all of the input parameters has been populated from, from that YAML file. Um, the description and summary, that kind of thing. And then here, if we had input data sets to the model, they, they would appear on the right here as well, but I didn't add any. 
Um, and something we've recently added is model versioning as well. So if your code changes, then you can add a new version of your model without um, breaking pre-existing workflows that rely on your older versions kind of thing, uh, which is really nice, a really good bit of functionality that we've been looking to add for quite a while. Um, so then the sort of meat of the modeling service is the actual workflows themselves. And this is where you come to run the models. Um, again, I've got one that I made earlier, but I'll describe the process of creating a workflow. Um, so you go up here and I'll just fill this in quickly, but this is just the metadata about your workflow, which we, we won't bother too much with. And so now you're into the workflow builder tool and you essentially add steps to this workflow in order to, um, you know, describe what you want to, to do on Daphne essentially. So we've got four different step types that a user can pick from. The first is the iterator step type. So this allows you to iterate over the same model step multiple times, but changing a, a given parameter within that model between a certain minimum and maximum value. Um, and we actually use a Monte Carlo style iteration for this. So it will sort of re randomly vary that parameter as it goes through. So you can imagine for something like uh, COVID sim, you might vary the R number between one and two. Um, it'll run a bunch of simulations in parallel, and then you can get some outputs, which you can then do some sensitivity analysis on um, to see how much the R rate affects things like mortality rates or um, transmission rates and that kind of thing. So to keep it simple, we won't, we won't do an iterative step today. Uh, so we jump straight into the model step. So this is how you can actually add models to a workflow. There's no limit to how many models you can have. So you can, in that sense, chain models together. Um, we will just add the one, uh, one model step today. So we back to our model catalog now, we can search for COVID and select that one. And then he, here was, would be where we uh, could use previous model steps to populate our new model step. So you can imagine if we had, um, we wanted to see the, re the effect of COVID on say demand for housing or something, we have a housing demand model. You could then link the two together. Obviously there has to be some sort of finagling of the outputs of the of model A because you need to make sure that model B um, can use those inputs. Um, so there's some extra work to be done there, which you could do as part of an, uh, an extra model step essentially. Um, so all the stuff that we populated our metadata file now becomes available to us. So we can, we can change the country, we can change uh, the R number, we can change how many people are actually complying with it, uh, the restrictions, et cetera. And then we can create our step so at the minute, this would just literally run the COVID model in the background and we'd never get any results out of that but because we haven't added a step to get results out. So the two methods that we have for doing this are a publish method, and this will essentially take the data that comes out of your model and put it into the data catalog that Bethan showed you. So you'd fill in the exact same um, metadata that Bethan showed and that would then create an entry in the, in the catalog that would be private to you, but then you could choose to obviously share that with other users as well. Um, and you can, ask, uh, currently not through the platform, but you can ask us to share your workflows with other users on the platform so they can make use of it and um, put their own parameters in, et cetera. And it's something we're currently working on is being able to share models and workflows through the same system that Bethan showed. Um, so this would, yeah, essentially just create a data set in the, in the catalog. This visualization step, also creates the data set in the data catalog, but then it also spins up a, a visualization to be able to get like, um, do some post-processing on your data essentially. Um, and at the minute, our only visualization type is Jupyter Notebooks, which for those of you who are not familiar, I'm gonna go through those in a second, but it's essentially an environment, a sandbox environment where your data has been loaded in and you can write Python or R code to draw some visualizations or get some post-processing results. Um, but we understand that that's not great for non-technical users because obviously they still have to write some code to generate some output. Um, so we're currently working with the University of Oxford to produce a drag and drop style visualization, which uh, we're hoping to add to the platform in the next couple of months. Um, and that will give non-technical users a much better way of creating those visualizations. Um, so we'd select that, we'd still fill in our metadata because it's still going into the data catalog. Um, and we'd create that step, we'd call it Viz or something. Um, but I'm not going to put the fill in all that in because uh, Bethan's shown you all that. 
and I already did it earlier. So this is a completed model. You can watch this in real time, which will update your the state of your steps. So um, as it's processing, it's a slightly different icon to the tick, uh, but these two steps are finished. So we can go on to our visualization step and click visualize and this will let us into the uh, Jupyter notebook. So all our data has been added to the, this is our output data has been added to this uh, folder called data. And then in here, we've got uh, CSV files, which we could browse through the Jupyter Notebook interface, but that's not great. So Imperial College London also very nicely uh, provided this R script for um, actually drawing some outputs from that data, which hopefully will load, yeah. Um, so this is just a load of code that generates some plots basically. And so I just click play at the top and then we get some nice um, outputs from our, from our data sets, which show um, mortality rates and that kind of morbid stuff about coronavirus. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of it on the modeling and visualization front. So um, back to Marianne.